been up in the Scott put up in the north for quite a lot. But um, can I just check? I want to. Hi, Julia. I've managed to figure. <laughs> Someone help me figure it out. Um, are, is there anybody who doesn't currently work in ELC in the room just now? Are you all working in ELC currently? Right, okay, that's fine. Um, there's a couple of slides I'm going to skip, okay? So I wasn't sure about the audience. You will have seen there's quite a lot of young people in here before. They clearly don't care about the expansion. <laughs> that's all right. I don't mind. Um, I won't be offended that I'm not cool to the young people anymore. Um, yeah, it's um, what I'll do is I'll skip over a couple of things and then we can maybe open up to a few more questions and stuff today. One of the things I probably wanted to concentrate on is I'm going to be talking about the national standard um, and funding for the child very briefly. Um, but there's a couple of things when it comes to workforce that I think we really need to be clear about um, when it comes to the national standard. So I've got a bit more information on that today um, in my presentation rather than the generalised stuff. But from our point of view, when it comes to the expansion, and Jennifer was talking earlier, are we actually going to meet the commitment? Um, we are very confident in the Scottish Government that we are going to meet the commitment. Um, all of the evidence that we have so far and the data that we have so far is telling us that we're on track to meet the commitment by August 2020. Now, one of the things that we're doing is, first of all, this type of thing. So coming and talking to people about are there concerns? Are there things that we can do to help? Are there things that we can make sure are going to make sure that we actually meet this commitment? So it would be really good today if there are any things that you want to raise or tell us about or things that we can do to help, please do let us know what those are. Because that's the point of what we do in Scottish Government. It took us a while to get to a point where we had a policy position and what we were going to do, and that was because we wanted to listen to people, we wanted to consult with people, we wanted to make sure that it was the right thing for the sector. But now we're trying to implement it. And that's why phasing's happening the way that it's happening. We have to make sure that people can try things out and not be scared to try things out. All right? There's no right or wrong way of doing this. There's lots of very different ways of doing it. But the right way will improve outcomes for children and families. That's all we want. That is absolutely the whole point of this. And I think what we would say from the Scottish Government's point of view, and I'll, I'll go on to the aspiration, is that the whole point of this pol policy is to close the poverty-related attainment gap and also ensure that the outcomes for children and families are improved from the very earliest stages. Early intervention is such an important part of making sure that everybody grows up to be happy, successful and fulfilled adults. So. The aspiration, we have ambitious aspirations. We know that this is not going to be easy, but everything good in life never does come easy. We have to try hard, but the reason we're trying hard is to make sure that children get the best start in life. So we are hoping that we can realize every child's full potential by prioritizing high quality ELC and unlocking choice for parents and carers, which Jackie very eloquently put um, earlier on. One thing that um, Kay spoke about from this care inspector, she was saying about that love is now in the health and social care standards. Well, it's also in our plans for funding for as a child. We know that if children feel loved, respected, and feel that sense of understanding, they are going to be more successful, and they have a right to be. Everybody in this country has a right to be happy. Everybody has a right to be successful and feel fulfilled. I'm very lucky. I feel very fulfilled when I come to work every day. Not everybody does. Not everybody has a career where they feel like, this is where I was meant to be. This is what I was meant to do. We need to make sure that our children do feel that. And I must admit, it was a very brave thing for ministers to come out and say, love is a big part of that. Um, and it needs to be and it will remain to be. So the approach is underpinned by getting it right for every child. Everything that happens um, when it comes to children and young people, any policy is underpinned by that. And you'll be very aware that we're doubling, nearly doubling, not doubling, never say doubling, you get into trouble, nearly doubling the number of hours from 600 to 1140. Funding follows a child will be introduced in August 2020. And as I say, Jackie went over a bit of that earlier today. But as she said, it places choice in parents and carers' hands. Regardless of whether you're a local authority, a private or a third sector setting, if you meet the national standard, we know that you are offering something that's going to improve outcomes for children and families, and parents and carers can be confident of that. So this is where that provider-neutral approach is coming from. Early learning and childcare will be a mixed economy model. 
and in August 2020. And lots of the plans, have been doing, I've been doing a lot of, um, of an overview of what the plans are across all the different local authorities. And all of them include the private and third sector and childminders in their plans about what they're going to do and how we're going to meet this commitment. That's in, underpinned by meaningful and genuine partnership working. That's why we're here today. We need to make sure that we're talking to everybody in the sector, not just the people in local authorities who are planning it. We need to speak to people who are actually doing it on the ground. And that's, that's where we are today. And we've also got the introduction of the national standard for all early learning and childcare settings. What that does is it means there's a consistent approach across the country. So if you can be a funded provider in Inverness, in the Highlands, you should also be able to be a funded provider in Dumfries and Galloway. Now, that's a massive cross-boundary arrangement. I'm sure that will never happen. <laughs> but it should be consistent enough across the country that it shouldn't matter where you are, you should still meet that, meet that national standard. Okay? So what is the national standard? Well, there's 10 criteria in the national standard. They're based on evidence, they're based on research, they're based on our understanding of what good quality at ELC is. The very first one is about staffing, leadership and management. I'll go into a bit more detail about that. But all that's asking for is making sure that staff are well supported, they have the right training, we have a well qualified workforce that are able to take forward those relationships with children and families. Because the relationships you have with children and families are absolutely at the heart of improving those outcomes. If those relationships aren't there, then you're very much less likely to improve outcomes for those children in your setting. The second one's about development of children's cognitive skills, basically linked to the quality of care and support in your setting. How are you meeting individual needs for children? How are you making sure that that child can actually develop and learn and is well cared for, safe, healthy, active, nurtured? I, could, I used to be able to reel them off really easily. I used to work in the care inspector, or I still do. I'm only on secondment to Scottish Government, but I think I've, I've lost my well-being indicator touch. Anyway, it's, it's making sure that they are all of those wonderful things. It also is looking at, do you have a framework for play and learning? So what are you doing in your setting that makes sure that children are going to develop and they're actually going to be able to move forward? We are thinking about whether there needs to be more, but in the operating guidance which is available downstairs, um, please do take some copies away with you. It tells you exactly how settings can meet these criteria, criteria in a lot more detail than I'll be able to go into today. So please do get a read through that. If you've not already had a look at it, it's really good to start to think about are there things I might need to do to improve the evidence when I'm going to go and apply to be a funded provider. Okay. Physical environment. Again, linked to the quality of environment in care inspector evaluations, you must be getting a good and above in all of your themes in a care inspector evaluation. But it also reiterates, which has come up now about three or four times today, outdoor play every day and regular access to a natural environment, a green space. Um, and a green space can be a public park, it can be a forest, it can be a beach which is not very green. I've not, never been to a green beach in my life. However, unless there's algae, lots of algae, that makes it green. But it's about it being a natural environment, something that's not the swing set and the slides down the park. Okay. Self-evaluation improvement. Do you use self-evaluation frameworks to look at what you are doing in your setting? And then do you have an improvement plan that helps you to improve the quality of what's happening? Most people will have that. And I hope, I'm hoping, as I'm talking through some of these criteria, you're sitting and thinking, oh, I'll do that. No, actually, i do that. Well, I'm not so bad at that. There's nothing in here to try and catch people out. It just is about making sure we've got everything that we need to make sure children have the best experience possible. Parent, parent and care, engagement and involvement in the life of the setting. All that means is, at the very top, can they actually influence what's happening in the setting as a whole? Do you consult with them? Do you ask them what you want to do? And then the second one is about how do you individually make sure that, that they are involved in their own child's learning. Okay, so it's that sort of double layer. Are they involved in the personal plan? You'd be looking at that in a care inspector inspection anyway. But how are you making sure that they are a part of that? Inclusion, basically, don't discriminate against any of the protected characteristics. 
follow the Equality Act 2010, which I really, 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 really hope nobody is doing. <laughs> I'm sure everybody is following that. Um, but there are lots of things in there about um, reasonable adjustments that can be made to care and learning settings. Okay. At the moment, what you might find is that a child with very complex additional support needs would just traditionally go to an additional support needs setting, and that may very well be the best place for them. Where there are more minor learning needs, it might be that there's an adjustment that can be made in, in a private or third sector setting, and it's about working with the local authority around what that might look like. But it has to be of best value. We're not asking for a local authority to come into your setting and put pulleys in and lifts and all that kind of stuff. It really needs to be about what's going to be the best placement for that child and working with the family about where that might be. Business sustainability, all we're asking for there is that your setting's not going to not be there the two, for the two years that, that child is there. We know that that transition can be a really have a detrimental effect and we want to make sure that children feel settled, safe and secure in the setting. So it's just to ensure that we've got a setting that's going to be in existence in a year, two year, four years time. Fair work practices, which I'm going to come on to in a bit more detail um, in the next part of the presentation, but what we know is that if staff feel well led, motivated, well trained and well paid for what they do, they're more likely to offer a better quality of provision. Payment processes, that's asking you not to charge top up fees for funded entitlement. We've obviously talked a bit about a sustainable rate. Uh, we did publish guidance on how to set that sustainable rate at the end of April. And what that looks at is, are you able to reinvest in your business to make sure that it, it is, again, you've got good quality resources, all those things. But equally, it talks about making sure that if a parent comes to you and says, I just want to take my funded entitlement within a model of provision, then they can take that. That there be, might be additional charges, but they shouldn't have to take hours that they don't want to take. Okay. The food one, is it healthy, is it nutritious, does it meet the setting the table guidance and the eat well plate? That's all we're asking for. Um, it's not about you having to offer a free meal before you can become entitled. Okay? Scottish Government will give the funding for that free meal commitment. So the criteria is related to what you offer as that meal, as opposed to the fact you have to offer the meal in the first place. All right? There will be, as part of the sustainable rate, a payment over and above what you will get paid for the ELC that will just be for delivering that food commitment. And there will also be um, money put aside for your milk. So we've just recently had the powers devolved to the Scottish Government about the nursery milk. So UK Government used to do nursery milk scheme. Does everybody know that that used to be a year? Um, they are, as far as we know, they are planning to stop that scheme. Um, and Scottish Government did not want to do that and asked for the powers to be devolved into Scottish Government so we could continue that programme. The reason that the, the um, UK Government are thinking about removing it is that there isn't actually an issue now with uh, underconsumption of dairy. However, our argument is that the reason there's no underconsumption of dairy is because we offer them the dairy entitlement. So we will be continuing that. That is a third of a pint of milk a day. And that's whether you're funded or non-funded. Every child in Scotland can get that. And then there's also funding for a piece of fruit or vegetable, which is a healthy snack. So we're doing that in addition to the milk commitment. So you will get funding for that as well. Again, regardless, so for your, if you've got zero to three, you'll also get that. Um, but that will be through a slightly different scheme. But there will be that funding available. Are there any questions about that so far? Just the national standard or anything that people want to clarify? Yes. Yes. So there was a multi-year funding agreement, and um, sorry, just to, for the video, there was a question about um, whether there was different funding to different local authorities. That was done because it cost different things, and but, but what we based our funding agreement on was the plans that were submitted to us by local authorities. Okay. So local authorities said this is what it's going to cost us to offer 11.40 hours. This is what it's going to cost us to give to give a meal, 
and then that was agreed with COSLA, the multi-year funding agreement, which is now until 2021-22, okay? So for the next, right through to implementation and beyond, there is funding. Now, I would probably say that this year has seen the biggest increase in funding because we're asking people to phase in. So as Jennifer was talking about earlier, there are some local authorities that need to build. There are some local authorities that need to think about um, also putting in a lot of them are increasing the rate that they're paying to partner providers. I know that there has been an increase in, in Highland specifically. So they're using that money to think about how can we phase in and how many children. And our guidance was the children who need it first, get it first. Okay, so it was based on levels of deprivation. Are they actually, you know, who, who needs to make sure we can get that funded entitlement earliest? Okay, but that was down to local decision. But there is a different amount of money per based on the census based on what local authorities put in as their plan and also with an inflationary uplift and an additional payment for the real living wage. Okay, which I'll come on to a bit more about the real living wage, but that was all calculated into the multi-year funding agreement. We are obviously working really closely with local authorities to understand what that's looking like and how we can maximise that budget within a local area. And we have a um, head of delivery assurance who started with us last month who actually worked in a local authority doing this type of stuff to start to think about are there questions and things that we can ask and is there sort of jigging that we can do to make sure that that money is maximised to make sure every child gets an entitlement. Does that help? Good. Okay. Any other questions just now? Doc? Lovely. So I'm going to skip this because you're all already part of it. So. I'm going to go into a bit more detail about fair work. I think most, most people that I see I go and talk to about funding follows a child, but one thing we don't really concentrate on is this fair work element. So fair work, essentially, there are five different conditions of fair work. So there are the five things that we look for in fair work practices is respect, security, opportunity, fulfillment, and effective voice. So the national standard criteria number eight, which is about fair work practice, is based around those five key principles of fair work. Okay? One of those is about paying the real living wage. And as I said in the question before, that's been added into the multi-year funding agreement to ensure that the sustainable rate will allow for payment of the real living wage. And the sustainable rate guidance also talks about, once you've looked at your survey of costs and what that actually does, that needs to be added on top of the sustainable rate. So you need to be making a decision about how much that's going to cost to be able to make sure that that can be paid within settings, okay? So we expect under criteria eight that you are working in fair work practices, all right? We want fair work practices, we need to make sure there's payment of the real living wage for those delivering the funded entitlement, and that's what fair work is about. So, the first one is about it being a fair and equal pay policy across the setting, including committing to supporting the real living wage that managers, lead practitioners and employers have clear managerial responsibilities to nurture talent and help individuals fulfil their potential. So are, are the staff being well managed, well led in that setting to develop as good practitioners? Promoting equality of opportunity and developing a workforce which reflects the population of Scotland in terms of a lot of the protected characteristics under the Equality Act 2010. Now I did get a question the other day to say, but what if I'm not attracting those people? That's absolutely fine. All we're asking for is that when you do go through your safer recruitment processes, that there's an indication that you're not discriminating against anybody regardless of those protected characteristics. We want to make it diverse. At the moment, the workforce is 96% female and predominantly white. That's where we're at. So if you look at any of the statistics, that's where we are that is not reflective of our population. In some areas it might be very, very, very much not at all. Um, one thing that we've been looking at is how can we, we've got a, a, a vast number of um, people with physical disabilities who are unemployed. And actually, for a child to see, especially a child who maybe has additional support needs to see somebody who has a physical disability or a, you know, a hidden disability, to be working in a setting, how empowering would that be? How much of a great experience would that be to understand that it doesn't matter? I actually watched a wee video about a guy who is, um, he has cerebral palsy, 
and he's, um, he's come up, he's a lawyer, and he's come up every time, he's come up against something, and he's now trained to be a QC, which is the person that stands at the front and says, this is not right, and all that, and he's, uh, but people didn't take him. He wouldn't, couldn't get employed because his speech was slurred. But it's people like that, it's people who, are tena who have the tenacity to go through and say, this is important. And I think we need to think about, can we make our workforce a bit more diverse in that way? Lots of other ways as well. But that's what we're asking for. Try to see if there are some barriers, are there things that we can do to get people into the workforce who can really add value to an experience for children. The other one is around security of employment and hours of work. Um, we don't want exploitative employment practices. I think most of you, if you are private and third sector, will also not want that. You don't want other employers being funded providers who believe that that's okay. I certainly would nice to work in the private sector and I would have been absolutely enraged by the fact that somebody down the road who was not operating in the way that they should be and treating their staff fairly and equally would be allowed to offer the funded entitlement. So it's to protect and make sure that it's reputable businesses, it's people who absolutely understand that staff are such an important part of the setting, such an important part of improving outcomes for children and families. That's what's key in making sure we have reputable businesses being fund providers. So it talks about unfair zero hours contracts. That's not to say there are zero hours contracts that actually work for a lot of people. So we're not saying you can't do them. It's just about it not being unfair. You also need to think about family friendly working in a wider life work balance. That's going to be challenging because the whole point you exist is to make sure that that happens for other people. So really challenging. What we are doing is we're going to be working with the Fair Work Department and um, Directorate, sorry, in Scottish Government to look at what does Fair Work actually look like in, e in an ELC setting and look at some of these things. How might that work? And it's absolutely not about saying, if I come to you as a provider and say, I can only work this, that and the other and that's it and you have to accept that. Even in local authorities in Scottish Government, there's an application to say, this is the type of working pattern I would like. And they can be put through or they cannot be put through. Sometimes they won't be put through because it doesn't fit with the lifestyle of the business. But it's about being open to that and making sure that those are there. And also supportive of progressive workforce engagement. So are you encouraging them to be a part of the trade union um, that they have available to them? And one thing I would say is that, um, and that's under effective voice, I should say, but um, one thing I would say about that is in the National Induction Resource, it does have a list of the unions that they can join. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the National Induction Resource next, um, just because it's a bit more about workforce, but um, it's a really important part of people feeling like they have a voice like, with you, your own setting. Um, but also, that they, you know, you've got regular staff meetings. Do you sit around the table and talk about not just business things, but about children, about families, but about how people are feeling? So when you're looking at your um, induction, your support, your supervision, your appraisals, does that all fit together? So again, hopefully in there, there's not a massive amount. I think people have seen fair work and kind of gone, oh, that's a big word, I don't know about that. And it was new, it only came in in April 2018. But as I say, we are going to try and do a bit of work around case studies. Um, I was in Aberdeenshire on Tuesday and met a childminder who has four assistants. She employs four assistants. Out and I was like, my God. But I, we've approached her because she's somebody, she's going to have to pay the real living wage. She has to put in fair work practices for her assistants. And we're going to try and think about can we support her to do that, first of all. And second of all, will she allow us to use that as a case study about how people can implement it in a childminding setting? So if anybody wants to be involved, let me know. <laughs> if you want to be involved in what, be a, be a guinea pig, then uh, we're open to suggestion. Any questions on the sort of fair work side of, of, of that? No? All these reputable employers in here, Jennifer, that's what it is. Very quickly then, I'm just watching the time. I've got two minutes to fly through the National Induction Resource. You'll be like, ah, it's fine, I can do it. Very, very simply, National Induction Resource for Criteria 1.5, you have to, your new staff have to know what it is, first of all. 
What it tells you is how to develop trusting relationships with children and their families, what your role is as part of a team, what your responsibilities are in keeping children safe, blah, blah, blah. The, po the col policy context, so really your staff, your new staff should understand about this expansion, okay? Your responsibility as part of SSSC, how to identify and engage with learning and the codes of practice, okay? But what it does really well is it takes you through reflective questions about that. So if you're a mentor, you've got staff in your setting who are mentors to new staff, it's got those in there and they can fill it out. So it's an online resource, it's available on the SSSC website, on the learning zone, really good, make sure you take it forward, and that's it. See how quickly I did that, Jennifer? I'm, 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 I'm always open to suggestion. Anyone got any 